I can remember that, you know, Sergio Leone's, ah, oh, hello everyone, here we are, it's time for midterm review, it's time to find out what's going to be on the exam, and so that's what it's all about tonight, is we'll look specifically at what we've been talking about, or what we, the videos have been talking about, and it'll be on the exam, so let's go ahead and get started. And so, first thing is, the exam is one week only. October 30th through November 6th. So you can even start on, if you so desire, you can start on Thursday, but if you want to do it for Halloween, there you go. You got Halloween to work on the exam. And it'll be, again, October 30th through November 6th. All right. It is in the social science testing lab. And... Uh, uh, some people don't get this right. They, they send me emails all the time saying, what's the link that I can take the test? No, you have to go there. You can't take the exam at home. Um, you have to go to the social science uh, testing lab or in Cottage Grove in Florence, works. But you have to be there to take the test. So it is uh, available then during their hours of operation. It is a computer exam. That is, it's an objective exam. You'll just, there, there are no written essay type questions. And there will be 50 questions. The good news is that you are allowed one three by five note card. And I don't, uh, I don't care if it's one sided or two sided. You can put whatever you need on that note card. And I always just emphasize that, you know, don't waste your time writing down things that you already know. If you have, if you know the history of, of the genres and all of that, there's no reason to write that down. But uh, it's stuff that you are un unsure about, of course, that's what you write down to assist. And the way you will know that is when we get through this study period tonight. Which reminds me that study guides are now available on Moodle. Um, uh, I hope so. <laughs> I did do everything I was supposed to, so I think it is available. So you can download the study guide. It is probably a little, has a little bit more information than what I give you tonight. So it, it, would, it helps you there. All right, moving on. I just want to remind you that you are responsible for the exam, and it is your responsibility to make the exam date and time, and the way to do that is to go to their website. As you see there on the screen, that website is also on the syllabus, and there you will find their hours of operation because it is so crucial. You, ha you have to be on their time schedule. Okay, there will be no makeup examinations, so you have one week to do it. That's plenty of time to do it. And let's get started with what you will find on the exam. And as you see there, the exam will cover the material in our everything in our first week, which was the classic Hollywood style, through this week, which is the romantic comedy. Okay, to begin with, you must have a good understanding of the overview of the American movie industry, which is essentially those three things right there. Hollywood produces films, Hollywood distributes films, and Hollywood exhibits films. Now, we're not talking about right now. We're talking about the history, the early years. They produce, distribute, and exhibit their films. So, in other words, uh, uh, MGM produces its films, it distributes its films, and it exhibits its films in their own theaters. When you uh, think about um, if you lived in a, a city or town that had a Fox Theater or a United Artists Theater or a Paramount Theater, that was from those old days when, they, when Paramount produced a film, it distributed a film to its own theaters. So that's 
kind of what uh, the industry was about right there, production, distribution, exhibition. The second thing is, that, uh, is the industry's use of genre to minimize financial risk, and we will look at that uh, later, exactly what that means. Moving on. Have a good understanding of the history of the motion picture. The early projection technology and the theory, the notion of what persists of, of persistence of vision. The concept that 24 still pictures running through a machine or you know being captured by a camera, then being projected by a projector, 24 frames per second gives us the illusion of movement. Now, 24 is what we say now because that's the standard for sound movies. For silent movies, back in those old days, that uh, a persistence of vision and the frames per second was anywhere from you know, roughly 16 to 20. Mostly it was like 16, 18 frames per second that gave us the persistence of vision that gave us the idea that there is movement. Also, uh, have an understanding of the key innovations and the individuals responsible. Recognize that our early movie machine was a kinetoscope. Uh, recognize the contributions of Edison, or at least have a good, you know, understand that Edison is our, our primary source here, and uh, Dixon. Uh, have an understanding of the Nickelodeon era, what that meant, the beginnings of movie theaters. Um, instead of um, just, just being an empty room where uh, somebody set up a projector, a novelty item, and you come in and you see moving pictures, but the Nickelodeon era is the beginnings of the industry, the theater industry, movie theater, or what you'd say in, in the UK, the cinema era. Uh, where you go to these movie theaters specifically to see the, uh, movies. Have an understanding, eh, basically what it is, the MPPC, which is the Motion Pictures Patents Company, which is the company set up by Edison to protect his, his movie machines. And the movie palace. The Nickelodeons give way to the movie palace. Huge theaters, huge places where you go to watch movies. Also, an understanding of the classic narrative style. It's the ways in which stories are told cinematically. The first method, or the first thing that we understand is equilibrium and disruption. What is that? It's an initial state of affairs is introduced after which something occurs to disturb this equilibrium. Very simple method of storytelling. It's the kind of storytelling that you can find in just about any kind of story, any kind of narrative, any kind of drama in which our, our initial, uh, initially what we see is everything is equal. Everything works. Everything is calm. And then something happens to disturb the equilibrium, to disrupt it. Okay, secondly, subsequent events attempt to restore the original status quo. But this is repeatedly frustrated and order is recovered only at the end of the film. So in other words, when our movie starts, everything's fine. Everything looks normal. No problem. Then something occurs. It can be anything. It can be a crime. It can be an act of nature, such as a hurricane, a tornado, earthquake. But something happens that disrupts our equilibrium. The effort then is all the events to restore our equilibrium. But as we make this effort to restore it, we are frustrated. Things occur that we can't complete this task. 
and that finally order is restored at the end of the film. Okay, the second narrative style, the second way we tell stories here is problem solving. Over the course of the narrative, characters struggle to achieve their goals or solve their problems. They overcome those who stand in their way, they triumph over adverse circumstances, and or transcend their own limitations. So, problem solving. Our hero must solve problems in order to return equilibrium. And then they talk about temporal and spatial limits. The temporal dimension is a specific deadline has to be met or a certain task has to be completed by a definite time. When I think of that, I'm always reminded of a film that was made in the late 1940s called VOA, in which our main character has been poisoned, and he is going to die. But he has to solve the crime. He has to solve, find the murderer, find the guy that's killing him, that's killed him. And uh, he has a definite time. You know, he's got, like... Uh, if I remember correctly, you know, the film runs like 90 minutes or something like that. He's got 90 minutes to solve it. The spatial dimension is characters moving toward precise destinations or geographical goals. I think of this in the, the countless number of westerns about the pioneers heading west because uh, they are moving in a geographical way to a goal. They're trying to to reach uh, the Oregon Territory, <coughs> excuse me, which of course is number four, the journey. Now our video series likes to talk about it this way. The journey is number one, a narrative. Characters move not only spatially, but they realize other non-spatial goals as well, such as making deadlines, solving mysteries, falling in love, discovering new worlds, and coming to terms with themselves and or their fellow travelers. So, yes, we do have a kind of physical journey, like what we just mentioned, like the, the covered wagons going west, but the characters also are on their own journey and they move in emotional ways, in intellectual ways, spiritual ways, and so forth and usually to a goal, and by the time that they have reached their spatial goal, while they have reached their physical goal, they have often reached a, a new point in their own lives. The second journey is the audience's journey. Our film series like to say that we are going to the movies. In other words, we, as an audience, actually get up and go somewhere to see it. What we see on the screen, as well, is what we are doing at that very moment. We are looking for goals. We are participating in deadlines, and we are undertaking journeys as well. It's a vicarious experience. We sit through the movie. The struggles of the hero become our struggles, and uh, the triumph of the hero is our triumph. And the last comment here that our film series talks about is segmentation. It is dealing with Aristotle's traditional unities. Okay, now what we mean by that is segmentation, or what we mean by segmentation is a process of structural analysis that breaks the film down into its basic narrative units. Now, what, what we have with regard to Aristotle, the dramatic unities, which are action, time, and space, what we have is that most films violate the traditional unities and lend themselves to this segmentation. Now, think in terms of it this way with regard to segmentation, especially if, if you're a filmmaker, you know how this works, and that is we have what we call a shot and a scene. Our shot is turning the camera on, turning the camera off. But a scene is the initial or, or, or a basic narrative unit of a movie. And we know that we make films in, 
uh, in a segmented way. We shoot scene one, and then we might shoot scene 12, and then we might shoot scene 24. And then we move on another day and shoot scene two and so forth. And what we do in the editing room is we put those segments together so it makes a logical and coherent whole. <coughs> All right. Now what? Classical film style with regard to the film techniques and the relationship to narrative. Understand these terms. Understand these concepts. Understand what mise-en-scene means. Mise-en-scene is the French word that is used, to, uh, which, which means roughly putting on the scene. What we talk about with mise-en-scene is everything that you see within the frame. That's everything that you see within this frame. So if you were looking at a movie and you were talking about its mise-en-scene, you would see in this particular frame, you see this crazy old guy up here with his mouth flapping around and his hands doing all kinds of weird gestures, his body moving, and then, oh, what happened over here? His hand is gone. We're not too concerned about that missing hand. We're just concerned with what is within that frame, including the weird thing that is behind me over here, that thing right behind me there. Those are the only things you see within the frame. Now, in some filmmakers, that becomes very essential because you take a filmmaker like Joseph von Sternberg, who loves to, who clutters his mise-en-scene. You know, there's depth. There's always something in the foreground, middle ground, background. So there's lots of things to see there. So that's what we say with, with mise-en-scene. What do you see within that frame? We talk about camera movement. Uh, remember, camera movement moves on a dolly, which can move laterally, which we sometimes, you know, moving this way, in which they sometimes call a traveling shot. But we also have dolly shot that moves inward. It moves toward you, which... <coughs> which we often, often call the, the tracking shot or a dolly shot. It moves on the z-axis. But we also have the camera that is pivoted sitting on the tripod. It moves side by side for a pan. It moves up and down for a tilt. Or the entire thing, again, tripod camera, can move up to give us a crane shot we have all of these things that are at the discretion of a director, and what are they used for? It's interesting to see <laughs> modern film techniques because often they just move the camera for the sake of movement. It really doesn't add anything to it, and you often wonder, why, what are we doing? Um, which is unfortunate because I think as a lot of people say, I just love moving cameras, but often a good filmmaker is one who moves the camera for a purpose. Lighting? the different types and effects. The mood lighting and sound. Know what mics are, mixing, scoring, continuity. A very crucial, very important part of film sound is music. And uh, it, there's uh, many, many books out there on the scoring of films. Uh, the shot and the scene, I already mentioned that. The shot is turn the camera on, turn the camera off. The scene is the basic narrative element. Scene editing, between and within scenes. In American film, it's called invisible editing because uh, really you're not, you're not supposed to know what's going on and these things are very much the basic uh, wide shot, uh, a long shot that introduces things, and we cut to a close shot, usually two shot of two people, then we cut to over the shoulder shots, then we cut to a close up shot, and we cut on these images back and forth, and um, it's usually considered invisible. We don't even know what's happening. Scene organization, a linear circular flashback, you know, uh, 
how is it when our movie is set up in a linear fashion, it goes from point A to point Z and that's it. Um, they can be circular, we can come back on ourselves or we can go flashback and, and start at this point, but we actually go before time, before we're up to that point and think of Citizen Kane in which there are at times multiple flashbacks. Think of cross-cutting. Cross-cutting is the idea that you can cut among scenes that are happening at the same time. Classic example, you're on the railroad tracks. You got the woman tied to the railroad tracks by the villain. She's tied to the railroad tracks. The villain is escaping. The train's coming down the tracks. The hero's on the horse trying to rescue her. And we cut among all of those elements. And as we do that, cross-cutting tells us that all of those things are happening simultaneously. Okay. Point of view editing, you know, the point of view is usually it's an omniscient kind of point of view. But we, we can do first person and also the 180 degree rule, which is don't cross the line, you know, to maintain continuity. And okay, move to the studio system. I already mentioned the Motion Picture Patents Company. The key players in the creation of the early studio system, there they are, William Fox, Carl Lemley, Louis B. Mayer, Samuel Goldwyn, and Marcus Lowe. The strategies of control, remember that it's an oligopoly, it's vertical integration. Vertical integration is what we already mentioned, that's production, distribution, and exhibition. Have an understanding of blind booking and block booking, you know, like uh, blind booking is essentially you have to, theaters would have to book a film without ever seeing it, you have to pay for it, show it without even seeing it. Block booking is if you want our good movie, you have to take all of our crappy movies too. Uh, run zones, clearances, all of that stuff you can find in the book. The Sherman antitrust ruling against the MPCC in 1915 more or less freed up movies to be used by anybody and everybody. That Edison no longer could control it, that the, they considered it a trust, uh, and so they broke it up. Also, the five major studios, Paramount Pictures, MGM, which was owned by Lowe's Incorporated, Fox, which became 20th Century Fox, the Warner Brothers, and the RKO Radio Pictures. RKO standing for Radio Keith Orpheum, and Radio Pictures, the result of Sarnoff uh, and his uh, trying to... to uh, uh, well, he owned, he owned NBC, he owned radio station, and, and he owned all that technology. He owned RCA, and he just wanted to get all of his uh, uh, equipment out there in the movies, so he, he buys a movie studio. And the three minor studios, Universal Pictures, Columbia Pictures, and United Artists. And the low-budget filmmakers known as Poverty Row. These are these corporations here, Republic, that noted for its serials, Monogram Pictures, Grand National, PRC, Eagle Lion, Allied Artists, and American International. All of them uh, very low budget, or let, let's say budget conscious studios. I uh, have an understanding of the Department of Justice Paramount case in 1948. That's an easy one. That's simply, you know, in 1948, they had to break up their oligopoly. They had to give up production, distribution, or exhibition, so they gave up exhibition. The effect of breakup on current film production, which is essentially that the studios are just bankers. They, they finance independent films. The average cost of production over time always skyrocketed where you can spend $200 million on the Lone Ranger and have it flop and make 50 cents and wonder where am I going to get my next 100 million. The rise of film artisans, independent film producers, the result of that breakup, and the old studios, as I mentioned, are now financiers and distributors of independently made films. The star. The star have masked personas created by film studios um, the role of mass media and the public in making and breaking stars is very simple. A star is the result of the public. The public likes it. The, they want more of this person, this star. At the same time, the public can turn against you and you're nothing. The blacks and other minority stars, for example, Sidney Poitier and how they fit in. The black, black exploitation movies of the 70s. 
And the idea that since the breakup of the studio system, stars can make it via other media, and then primarily that's television. And we move on to genre. <coughs> the ability to categorize movies. Genre serves to stabilize an otherwise unstable movie industry, and they do it through familiarity. Each new film banks on a number of familiar elements, motifs, and themes, but in a new way. Think of it if you're a musician in terms of theme and variation. It is, we know, we have bazillions of westerns out there, but they're all done in a different way, and we like that. We want to go see a western, and we enjoy it when they're done in a different way, especially when we say the best westerns are made by one guy like John Ford, and you go, yeah, I want to see more of those westerns by John Ford. Okay, speaking of genres in the western, the Western is distinctly, Amer distinctly American, is based on dime novels and real-life characters, and three essential ingredients. There's the hero, the villain, and the landscape. That's essentially what we look at when we talk about Westerns. And to move on, the symbolism that we find in a Western is East meets West, fact meets fiction. Most of the time, it's all fiction. The Westerns created a myth of America, by just inventing things. Uh, taking a real person's name, but changing that person around into something other than what that, that person was, and it creates for us a myth. Culture versus nature, often, you know, the, the nice thing about seeing a Western is the panorama of, of the, the West. And cultural conflicts in the modern type Western is space films, the final frontier. Then moving on to American comedy. What that's all about is comic expression of social repression. We know that it's, um, it's, it, it's uh, societal, you know, in the, especially in the 1930s. Uh, during the Depression, it was fun to just destroy uh, the upper crust, the ones who still had money. Themes of American, con uh, of American comedy are racism, social integration, the comic disintegration and disorder and containing chaos. Those are all terms that you can find in the book. I wouldn't worry too much about getting absolute definitions about it, just having a basic understanding of it. Also with class and democracy. But do know the popular comedy actors, the history and type of comedy that we have seen. In silent comedy, it is essentially slapstick. It's physical comedy. And that's exemplified by Chaplin and Keaton. With early sound... It, it remains, there's a lot of slapstick, but there's also verbal wit, and that is best expressed by Laurel and Hardy and the Marx Brothers. The screwball comedy is a hybrid of the romantic and the slapstick. Um, that's especially true of, of Preston Sturge's work, where he has lots of pratfalls, but the verbal wit is very strong. Comedies following Screwball, these are thesis comedies, the black, the dark comedy, animal and raunchy comedy, family comedy, and so forth, blah, blah, blah. That's about it. If you are confused, bewildered, rattled, depressed, and desperate like I am, then you can stop by during office hours, or you can send an email, and I will try to set you straight. I will not guarantee it, but I will try to set you straight. Remember, the study guide is available online. Go to Moodle, download it. And uh, it, there it is. It's on the web. Ha, ha, ha. There'll be no makeup exams. And you're responsible. The end. Thanks. Have a happy Halloween. Enjoy yourselves. Bye. Any questions? Lane Online. Learn. Unlearn. Relearn.